I'm a feminist, but I'd snog a men's rights activist in exchange for one week in Sofia Vergara's body. Fair. 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 The first half I was not on board, and then I was like, oh, she said I the mean, one thing. To be honest, I don't think I would want longer than a week in Sofia, because I think some people it's would be like, some people would be like, well, then you're just going to want another week. You're going to be disappointed. No. I think one week of experiencing it, but then I think if you look like Sofia Vergara, people talk to your body and they don't really hear what you say. And I suspect she struggles all the time to be heard. So I think I would like to do one week and I would get out a lot in that time. <laughs> I would not be home at all. Or clothed. I'd be walking down the high street in a bikini and I would be snogging lots of boys and then I'd be happy to go back. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but when I met the director of the play that I'm in, I told her that I'd read the script and loved the part and had to do it once I'd read it. And that's not strictly true. I googled the poster <laughs> and I saw this woman wearing a corset and boxing gloves and it was the hottest thing I've ever seen. And I thought, I have to be in that, I have to be in that, oh my God. And luckily it is phenomenal, but yeah, that was the spark. Fair. I'm a feminist, but I'm going to LA at the end of the month. And somebody, sort of jokingly, who sort of knows, basically somebody offered to introduce me to John Hamm. <laughs> Regular listeners of the podcast know. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> it's most shocking. Here, Deborah. No, I'm not looking my best at the moment. I'm overtired and I'm behind in my grooming. I'm saving meeting him for when I look perfect. Don't applaud that. Don't they, you applaud that. They understand. That. They're my people and they understand. They understand. They That's understand. the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm not endorsing that message. I'm, listen, I just want to... I don't, first, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. I learnt that when I was young. Once you've made that first impression... Then they sort of, they've got this idea in their head of who you are. Then you can deviate from that. Then you can be like, oh, I've just come back from yoga, no makeup. Sure, they already know who you are. May I swiftly rebut? Mm. I would just say that so often I look back at pictures of myself and I know in that picture I thought I looked like shit. And I look at that picture and I go, damn, I looked really good. And I think that's what would happen. I think you go to L.A., whatever you look like, and you look back at a picture from this... Yeah, when I'm 80, year. when I'm 80, but I w obviously I will. But that's not when I'll be perusing the Instagram pictures. It'll be the following 48 hours that I'll be upset. Just let me not meet John Hamm if I don't want to. Yes. Now... <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I'm working with a really talented bunch of people at the moment and doing this play. It's an absolute joy. And the assistant director is a young lady called Jackie, and she's fantastic. She's so talented and accomplished. And one day she was really irritating me. And I realised it was because she's young and has her whole life ahead of her. So, uh, yeah. That was, that was bullshit. Is she, yeah. Is she 18? She's not, but she looks it. She's like, oh my God, I always get ID'd. Uh, you know, like, oh God. <laughs> I've run she, this past her. She's very comfortable with me sharing this. Would she like to meet John Hamm? Yeah, she would. She's a cool girl. Mm. Well, she's probably meeting him right now. And <laughs> not second guessing herself. No. I'm a premise. Oh. <laughs> I nearly said I'm a supremacist. Now, there's In a reason. <laughs> there's a reason. Okay. You will understand. I'm a feminist, but the other day I saw a white supremacist attacking a white woman on the street. It was out front of the BBC and he was shouting at her, the BBC hates white people. I mean, famously. The BBC has never featured a white person. I completely see his point. I stepped in and defended the woman from the white supremacist and then he started attacking me saying we're just having a conversation you're the one causing trouble anyway you're an ugly bint I know I then felt I'd got the heat off her and I withdrew he then followed me on his bicycle he had dreadlocks by the way and that's important just so you can get the picture keep an eye out followed me on his bicycle and shouted 
Anyway, it wasn't her I called ugly, it was you. And again, just gave me like 45 synonyms for ugly. He basically started shouting, you're ugly, you're grotesque, you're this, you're that. And I rang, I was so upset, I rang Susie Wacoma, who had to talk me down. <laughs> so Susie Wacoma, a black woman, had to comfort me, a white woman, <laughs> because a white supremacist had called me ugly. So I'm a feminist, but when I went to a book launch for a really good friend, you, you don't know her, uh, who has a book out, Sunday Times top bestseller, just to say, no, you, you don't know her. Um, she, uh, I was so proud to be there for that moment, you know, and stand with her in her light and see her having her moment. And the second her back was turned, I furiously went to the index to see if she'd mentioned me. <laughs> I had, hadn't I? You had, yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank God. Like, way more than I thought you would. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Um. Live from the BFI in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Jessica Regan, and our very special guest, Jessica Hines, talking about women fighting on stage and screen. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis-White, with me is Jessica Regan, and we're talking about women fighting on stage and screen. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh my God, there's loads of people and they're lovely. People say that it's always sold out and they can't get a ticket. Yes. Um, but mm. often people don't use their tickets, as you can see. I, I, um, I can some, see. Some, there are some seats available. Uh, yes. So if anybody's outside in the corridor waiting, you just shout out. And if anyone comes in late, which they definitely will, just tut like good British feminists. <laughs> We're very good at the tutting, British feminists. I mean, British people are good at tutting as it is. Feminists are experts. We, I mean... <laughs> There's no better tutter than a British feminist, in my opinion. Yeah, we don't tut in Ireland. We just say, oh, go fuck yourself. So, <laughs> sort of... It's true. It's the Irish way. I am originally Australian. <laughs> and, uh, You're familiar with yeah, that work. Well, no, uh, there, there we say... We exported them, so... No, yeah, well, yeah. In Australia, we say, rack off. And that was not just something they invented for neighbours. Um, that's a topical on-screen reference, neighbours. <laughs> For those of you who remember the 80s <laughs> slash 90s. Edgy. Just give us a cheer if you remember the 80s. Yeah. Just give us a cheer if you weren't born yet. Oh. Uh, no, no, I'm just... Say the Irish thing. Go fuck yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm, not, I'm not interested in people who <laughs> weren't born in the 80s. There. I think anyone's ever applauded me I'm for not, saying that. I mean, no, I am interested in people. I'm a feminist, but I'm not interested in people who were born, weren't born in the 80s. That is not right. There are vulnerable children. They weren't here in the 80s. Listen, I love vulnerable children. I mean, all children, not just vulnerable ones. All children are vulnerable in a way, if you know where to pinch them Not right. Not in West London. Have you ever taught in a school in Chiswick? It's not very vulnerable. Oh, they're yeah. previous students. Octavia can speak for herself, do you know what I mean? Well so, able to stand up for themselves in certain schools yeah. in West London. No, I like vulnerable children and I like people who were born before the 80s. But I think if you don't remember the 80s, you shouldn't be able to drink. <laughs> do you see what I mean by that? That's, That's my... Connection. That's my problem. I just think you, you, people who were born, like people now who were born in 2000 can drink this year. That's what I'm saying. I have an issue with it. You should have witnessed at least 10 minutes of the 20th century or you know, you have no business drinking, driving. No. If you were born after 9-11, just no. No business voting. And I don't care if it is for centenary of the suffragettes and you were coming of age within it like some kind of poem <laughs> that's what's happening you are fulfilling if you were 18 this year you were fulfilling the promise of the suffragettes like a poem <laughs> is anybody 18 this year? <laughs> just one <laughs> yes are you? Oh. <laughs> what date? 1st of July 1st of July so you've already done it yeah. okay we've missed it okay no cake <laughs> Call off the cake. Call off the suffragette-shaped cake. It's tactless to have a suffragette-shaped cake because most of them are on hunger strike. Now, 
am I wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's not right. Ah, we're having a good time. Okay, all right. The suffragettes were violent. They were very fighty. Yes. Oh, that, yes Tom, ma'am. why were there no clips about the suffragettes punching people in the <laughs> montage? Why were all the clips of Catwoman? <laughs> I can't imagine why. And Bond girls beating each other up. And none of the suffragettes, interesting. <laughs> Nobody in a long skirt, actually. There was a lot of... This is what happens if you let a man make your feminist montages. <laughs> but I can't edit because women can't use technology. Now... And there's the rub. I mean... <laughs> I think Tom knows where the rub is, and it's not there. Um, So before we get into women fighting on stage and screen, because uh, you are doing a play at the moment, aren't you? I'm doing a play. Which you are punching. Yes, ma'am. I'm doing a play about Victorian female boxers, which was a thing. Oh, yes. It was underground. It was before boxing was regulated so a lot went on it's like when you see films that happened before censorship in the Hayes Code and they're black and white and you're like whoa how do they get away with that it's a bit like that there was all kinds of things happening in London with women uh, fighting uh, sometimes for titillation but actually there were some really amazing lady Victorian boxers um, who were dedicated to it and our story our play is it takes four women and uh, how their lives intersect and what the boxing how it empowers them frees them and uh, all that wow and what's your character? My character is Matilda Blackwell and... Uh, she a real person from history? Or the, a fictionalised version? They're fictionalised versions but they are all drawn from real inspiration and research. This play's been 10 years in the making and it feels like that's a very long time to tell this absolutely brilliant story by Joey Wilkinson who's here tonight ladies and gentlemen. They're all really three dimensional characters. Um, Matilda is a businesswoman. She's fierce and she's the strongest female part that's ever come across my desk. Wow. Yeah, she's the strongest, most fully realised. Did I'm quite surprised that women in Victorian times boxed. Mm-hmm. What do you think drew them to it? Was it money? Was it fame? Was it the desire to rip off their corset and scream at the sky? I think all of the above. I think absolutely all of the above. That's very much why I podcast. <laughs> Money, fame, and the desire to rip off my corset and scream at the sky. Yeah. And I've done one of those things. <laughs> uh, ripped off my corset. Hello. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I won't participate in Spanx. Um, right. At all. Well, why am I trying to trick people into thinking mm. that I'm somehow smoother than I am? It feels I'm a... desperately unhealthy. It feels... You can feel your circulation stopping. I'm oh. worried, like, I'll lose a leg if when I wear... F- shapewear what i don't get about shapewear is it's got to go somewhere yeah and so it i find you get a roll here it just rolls up and then the shapewear the spanks start to roll down and then you get this sort of artificial roll under the breasts and then this sort of roll of elastic underneath and i'm like look i mean i'd rather just be the shape i am than a pretend shape that somehow does not look human. And that has rolls in places you didn't have before you I put on the I didn't even have wear. before. I didn't have them before. People, you... I think people know that my stomach is not concave. I think they've guessed that. If anybody knows me, they've guessed it just from the way I've sat, just by a sheer glance. So suddenly if they see me out on a Saturday night, I don't think they're fooled. <laughs> What I favour instead of shapewear, pleats. Always have a little pleat. That's what I say. Comfortable, roomy. It can breathe. It can breathe and you can breathe. It's good. I should start a range, shouldn't I? Yeah. Can we please have a wonderful Guilty Feminist welcome for Deborah Francis Weiss? So I can't look at violence on the screen. Anything promises to be violent, anything that looks like someone might get violent, I go, ah, 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 I can't watch it. I have to look away, I look through my hands, and sometimes I even have to stick my fingers in my ears so I can't hear it. And then generally, if I'm watching something with Tom, he will tap me on the shoulder and say, it's all right, it's gone now. <laughs> Tom watches something, he watches a genre uh, that I call punch face. So I'll say, well, oh, you're watching Punch Face. I'm going to go and do something else. Because Tom watches, you know, those kinds of shows, you know, those kind of box sets. Walking Dead, Zombie Punch Face. 
the other kind of shows he likes are a sort of Gordon Ramsay shouting at people in kitchens. Um, we refer to those as lunch face. Um, even suspense, anybody following anybody. My friend and I started to write a thriller. We were really enjoying writing it, so we thought we'd better watch lots of thrillers because we'll learn a lot from watching them. Both of us were so pathetic. Honestly, the whole of the time we were like, oh God, I can't look, oh my God, oh my God, is she still doing it? Oh, stop, oh God, oh no, don't go down there, why are you going there? And I looked at her and I went, you know, we're writing a film we could never watch. <laughs> and that is true. I could not watch my own thriller. I'm so scared of watching violence generally. And I think it's because most of us spend our whole lives avoiding violence. So many of our confrontations in real life, or even not our confrontations, our tiny status signals to each other are ways of avoiding violence. High status people, you know the people that you meet, are a bit like this. They're saying, stay away from me, I bite. And low status people are saying, stay away from me, I'm not worth biting. Every aggressive interaction is a way of avoiding a fight because on the savannah, fights were expensive because they cost calories and caused injuries. So at the moment, I have a cat and two small kittens and there has been no physical contact but quite a lot of status signals saying, fuck off, you little bitch. Hissing, walking around, puffing out, being like, if you come over here, I'm totally going to scratch your eyes out. Okay, you have come over here, now I'm going to go a bit further away and then make a big face again. <laughs> That's what all interactions are that aren't actually punching, that are in any kind of negative or confrontational territory. It's amazing we don't punch each other more, really, because we're essentially animals. But we punch each other very little, if you think about it, day to day. Most of the time... Things like, if she looks at my boyfriend again, Janine, if she looks at my boyfriend again, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. If you look at my boyfriend again, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. You better not look at my boyfriend again because I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. All of that is a way to avoid a fight. Because if you really wanted to punch them, you wouldn't warn them. <laughs> Warning someone tells the person you don't want to punch them. And that's why you're saying, don't do this or I will punch you. I have, I think, only physically accosted someone twice in my life. Once was when I was 10 years old and I was at a sort of camp for not wayward children. It was just a holiday camp. It was just a sort of day, a day play centre in the holidays that my mum sent us to. And this girl was like really horrible. And she looked at me and she went, your plaits are so messy. Did you do those yourself? Because they look awful. And I said, no, my mother did them. And she went, then your mother's a boss-eyed freak. So I pushed her off the swing. <laughs> she fell quite heavily into some leaves. My sister backed me up. She never spoke to me again. But I clearly didn't learn, well then be... I, was, I think I was a bit scared of what I did because I haven't really accosted anyone again as far as I can remember, except a couple of years ago in a club where some men were so nasty and aggressive and entitled and they were taking up all this space and they kept banging into us. And I was sort of saying, oh, I was here. And I had a really bad back. So I'd sort of, it was a music gig and I was sort of stood at the back by a wall because I had particularly bad back. And so I was there somewhere I could kind of lean. And he kept coming into my space and he kept coming into my space. And I said, sorry, kept saying, excuse me, sorry. Could you just, sorry, sorry, sorry. And eventually he went, oh, shut up, love. We were here first. He was not there first. That's key. He was not there first. He went, oh, we were here. Anyway, who do you think you are? And so I tipped his beer all over him. <laughs> I, d I feel you shouldn't applaud that, but I understand why you do. Um, I was with a guy, not Tom, a guy who likes going to music gigs, a friend. And afterwards he said, can you not do that again when you're with me? Because he won't punch you. He'll punch me. Which is a good point, but one reason I can feel I can do it. Now... <laughs> So here's the thing. In real life, we're always pretty much avoiding confrontation or avoiding actual physical violence. The confrontations we have are usually to delay or, in fact, put off forever anyone punching anyone, and that is why it is quite rare. But that's why we enjoy the catharsis of seeing it on stage or screen. That's why. Because it would be fun right now, in a way, as much as I hate violence, I reckon I could force myself to look at somebody punching Brett Kavanagh in the face repeatedly. I... If I got to see Offred 
slash June, kill Fred incredibly slowly, I would watch it in slow motion. <laughs> so there are times when the catharsis of what we can see on screen fills us with a hope for our own freedom. It fills us with an extra power that makes us feel like we can take up more space in the room and it lands the punch so we don't have to. Thank you very much. Hello, Guilty Feminists. Please come and join me, Jessica Regan, for Big Speeches Workshops in London, October 14th, November 18th at the Bunker Theatre. That's October 14th and November 18th at the Bunker Theatre. We're going to find our voice, build our confidence and take our space. More dates to follow. Places are going fast. See you soon. Our guest today is a writer, actor, and now film director. Uh, you will know her from Spaced, W1A, and Paddington 2. Please get incredibly excited and make extraordinary guilty feminist woohooing noises for the wonderful Jessica Hines! <laughs> Jessica Hines. So we've got two Jessicas. So yeah. Jessica Sandwich, are you enjoying it? Very much, very much. So Jessica Hines, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm such a big fan and I've been a huge fan since Spaced. And I think that was a really interesting program in terms of sometimes it's, it's sort of, like I remember that kind of slow motion fight in the street and yeah. the sort of fun that you used to have with those kind of genres. Mm. And now here you are, making a film about the called The Fight. Yes. Well, I've always been interested in conflict. Obviously, you know, being inspired by film, but also, you know, by comedy. But you wouldn't necessarily put the two things together. And though The Fight is funny and warm, it's not actually a comedy per se. Yeah, um, no, it's, it, it's... It started out slightly more as a sort of comic idea. And then as I was left alone to evolve it in a way that is glorious when you do something low budget they just kind of left me to it to a large extent it kind of evolved into something much more like a drama um, what drew you to this story what uh... well i mean the inspiration for the film itself was trying to conceive a, a film that i could make in folkestone which is where i live and act but the specific idea came from going to a boxing gym which is actually featured in the film which is all the red walls and it's an amazing old boxing gym it used to be part of a school and it's up this really ratty sort of old iron staircase and on Tuesdays and Thursday nights you can go down and for two pounds you can box for an hour and I started going because I wanted to start boxing because I wanted to yeah. channel a few things which is why boxing is fantastic and I wasn't boxing per se I was boxer sizing or box fitting which is the sort of um, so you're not really punching anyone you're doing all the movements that's what I was doing then and that's what I was doing in a group in a class you know with music so it's kind of fitness but you get to put the gloves on right at the beginning and you spar with other women and you it's a brilliant exercise but also you do get to kind of spar and punch and you get to punch the punch bags but then you also see some of the other women, particularly at that time, who were part of the kind of amateur boxing group who were doing the warm-up and then actually getting in the ring. What I was really amazed at was, because it was a women's night, I was just really inspired by the women who were doing it. And obviously we're all ages and shapes and sizes and all from different experiences. And I felt that there was one thing that really did unify us all, which is that we all had something or someone or something that we wanted to punch, you know? And I was just inspired by the women who were in the group and how uh, strong they were and how strong some of the women really were I mean some of the more professional boxers who were doing amateur boxing were so strong looking and just how inspiring and how great that was just to be even in the vicinity of that yeah. you know and it just I sort of started thinking up a story about a woman who did this kind of boxing because I'm inspired by fighting films and actually that what you're talking about is when you see fighting on screens and you see a woman or someone you can identify with or someone you can relate to doing what you want to do it's so empowering I remember that feeling very clearly watching Kill Bill and thinking how you know it didn't matter that it wasn't real that she wasn't no. really kung fuing the fact that she was a woman and she was doing that was amazing and that's so that's what I wanted to kind of go for and I wanted to create and I love the genre I love the kind of rocky genre mm -hmm. I love the sort of you know that format but to actually create something that women could relate to and get into and have that feeling when you leave the cinema where you think yeah come on come on let's go let's go there's something about because I've been doing this sort of training for the play that I'm in and something about putting on the gloves 
getting into those positions, even like you said, when you're just sparring, because we do have a montage, you cannot do a boxing anything without a montage. So you have a theatrical montage. We have a theatrical montage of our training. And it is the most exhilarating, thrilling thing I've ever done on stage. How did you feel? Were you surprised? Did it take you back when you gloves go on? And even learning some simple moves, you're like, ooh, it just, your centre shifts or something. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've always, you know, been a fighter anyway. Mm -hmm. And I've always done different classes that were sort of combat based. And I, again, I, you know, I did that in space where I did the kind of kung fu thing. And I love kung fu genre. Kung fu hustle was another one. There's some amazing female fighting in that as well. You know, so I love that. So I kind of fancy myself a bit, you know, yeah. as a sort of bruiser. So, but when I actually really started sort of training and I kind of loved it even more. Did it feel like it, coming home almost? Well, um... Or revealing a part of yourself? Yeah, I think it feels quite natural, I think. Yeah. You know, I think it feels quite natural to be in that state. And I, I enjoy the physical confidence that comes with oh, yeah. it. And knowing that in that stance, you're powerful. You mm. know, the school I grew up in, all the girls fought. You know, wow. the girls were, oh, really? were, were violent. Yeah, they were vicious. scrappy. Yeah, 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 very, very much so, yeah. Did you yeah. go to school in a women's prison? Was yes. <laughs> yes, I did. No, I didn't. I just, went to, I, just, I just went to a, just a normal, normal state school. school. I mean, but there was you know. a lot of... There was a lot well, there was, yeah, there was particularly, I don't know. I mean, and I think it, I, maybe it's, it's, it's... I don't know if it was... There wasn't my school. There was a lot of structural violence between girls. With, structural violence. Yeah, like this leaving, was physical, leaving people out. Spin you around on the... Yeah. You know, like... Get oh, you. that was very but, rare I mean, at my I school. I mean, I tended to sort of try and avoid it, but the, but other friends were more confrontational. There were scraps at my school, and one is really indelibly printed on my mind. I remember where it was a bit of a David and Goliath situation, but I remember just being so compelled, I couldn't tear myself away, mm. you know, and it was... I think we're not allowed to be aggressive. And mm. while I don't obviously condone violence whatsoever, no. these girls had had a, an outlet, a boxing training, something like that. Channel Maybe it. they wouldn't mm. have been scrapping. Absolutely, yeah. And... What are you hoping that women and men take away from it? Because we are expected to watch Rocky. This is, a, this is not just a film for women. Mm. Go and watch it. Men, please go and watch it. Men especially get tickets. <laughs> you too. Buy tickets now. It's on at the BFI. It's coming up. <laughs> they're not um, What are you hoping that people will take from it? How are you hoping they're going to feel? Or how does this story change? I really, I really want people to feel strong. I want people to feel strong. You know, I want to feel strong. I want to encourage other people to feel strong. I think it's important. I think, you know, when I leave something and I feel somehow empowered or validated, you know, I'm so grateful for that experience. So I hope that this does that, you know, and, and then there's a shot at the end. It's, it's, she's kind of got the silky hat on because she goes back. She kind of keeps training on the boxing and, and it's the sort of lights gets in the ring, you know, and it's so exactly... It's a sort of cliche, but I wanted that, and I wanted that for kind of a mother of three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. It's, what's interesting yeah. about watching the trailer, and if you're listening at home, I think we will be able to put a or link to Or any mother, or any trailer. woman. Listen, I don't want to say, okay, mother, I wanted that for all women, okay? It doesn't matter. No, 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 but I that's that an example. terrible. But when... when no, you know, I understand why you say mother, though, because... seven, you know, or whatever, or, or women of no, a nun, uh, I, you know, like... I, I, I don't know, do you, I, don't feel you, I don't feel you do need to qualify that. Because, this world, because I'm so worried. I, like, I know, of of course. No, no, no. But you're not leaving women without children. Now, I don't have children. Jess doesn't have children. But when women have children, they're often beatified and they're expected yeah. then to only be nurturers. So I do understand why you say it in this context. I don't feel left out. I feel more that you're saying, especially somebody who's then who, who has those gendered norms pushed on them by society. Yeah. Because you have to be strong. I feel like women have live in this sort of constant sort of, you know, sort of timorous dichotomy mm. where it's like we're told, you know, to be a woman or to be feminine, you know, you have to sort of embody these sort of spurious qualities of, mm. you know, sort of weakness or... or Delicacy. You know, and, and yet that seems to me in every single aspect of every single experience of every single woman I've ever met, there is no way you can be a woman and not be strong. It's impossible. We you, know, it and, and, you know, and I've found the stronger I get, the more feminine I get because the more Love empowered that. I am and the more mm. and the more good I feel. You know, and that to me seems like the absolutely, you know, that well, seems like a reality, you know. One thing I thought about watching the trailer, and if you're at home you'll be able to get a link to the trailer, we'll set that up, mm. is that I feel like if a man had written and directed this, the fighting would be sexualized and the fighter would be sexualized. And I, what I loved about watching it is that she's not wearing any makeup. There is not a sort of overtone of girl on girl action to it. Now, listen, if you enjoy girl on girl action boxing there is, films, there is, there is, <laughs> I'm not there suggesting is, there there's is. anything wrong with girl on girl action boxing films, yeah. but I am suggesting that if a man had written and directed it, that would almost of necessity be there. And it felt to me like you were the hero 
And this wasn't about a gaze on you. This was about your viewpoint, which was, or your character's viewpoint, which is really powerful. Did you think of that when you were yeah. watching it, that you didn't want it to be Kill Bill as much as you like that in a way? Absolutely, absolutely, of course. You know, that was a brilliant thing about having the freedom to make it, is that I didn't have to do that. You know, I was able to be as raw and real as possible. And I, you know, when we're doing the sparring in the ring, we only had one day to do, we had such, we only had 12 days to do the whole thing. We had one day in the box. 12 days to yeah. shoot the whole thing? 12 days to do the whole Holy thing. Hell. I know. What? What have I done with my life? I mean, <laughs> can't think. What have I, I done in the last 12 days? Definitely not made a film. And um, we were in the boxing ring and um, the fantastic thing is we got these real professional boxers. So the two boxers, another Jessica, who's a boxer who I'm sparring is a proper professional boxer and so not a stunt boxer, significantly. Yes. So when we were doing a lot of the punching, you know, it was just like, well, punch me, you know. So she was, you know, obviously I was aware that it was coming but, you know, when she's kind of punched me on the pad, she is punching me and then she did actually on one of the take the fact that the take that we used I, my head was up higher than it should have been and she did actually crack my cheekbone oh my god so then she cracked my cheekbone and I fell down and I was like did we get it did we get it and they said yeah 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 and then my sister who was part of the team said I could actually see on camera your head gear slightly starting to move away <laughs> from your face as my cheek kind of just like oh my sort of swelled world. up but luckily in the film I had a black eye on that side of my face anyway. So, hey, every cloud. So yeah. that was all, so it was all good. Every, <laughs> every writer, director, actor's cloud has, a, <laughs> has an engorged cheek. Yeah. Um, yeah but I... Jessica, when you're doing it on stage, mm -hmm. when you're boxing on stage, clearly you couldn't take a real punch every night because it's a longer run. We do. Do you? We do. Um, that's where the course it's actually come in handy. It's not entirely, it looks hot, like I said, but it, it, the course has provided a lot of protection. And because this is a scrappier form of boxing than this contemporary boxing, you know, you guys understand now, like a lower uh, centre of gravity, but they were like the kangaroos back then that was all being upright and holding your ground. So oh. it's, it's period boxing. We have a wonderful, wonderful fight director, Alison de Berg, but there's a lot of contact fights. We've got a really stunning actress who is, 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 is so physical and fantastic. And one of the actors is James Baxter and Fiona Skinner. And they have really real fights. They are scrapping. They are going for it. And we have these gloves. We have protection. We're very safe. But you can't pull every punch. And I have a few contact punches. I get it in here a bit. And, um, and I throw a few. What I was a little bit unnerved by is I do have one real, like, contact punch to the abdomen that I deliver with quite a kick-ass line. And it, it's... What's the line, can you say? Um, before she started to make mistakes poof, right <laughs> pretty cool okay um yeah and it feels good <laughs> i was shocked at how I, I found myself looking forward to that contact punch anyway um yeah <clears throat> no but it just there's, there's something empowering about it and you know we're, we look into each other's eyes we're going to take each other on this journey before a fight there's a lovely kind of sisterhood and it's i totally know what you mean how the stronger you feel the more of a woman i felt yeah. the, the more mm. like physically in my body that this role has, has given me. I think it's the biggest cultural lie that strong women are not feminine because absolutely the opposite is true. That's it's entirely the theme of the, the play. And true. there's this big scenes about that where, because the Victorian thinking was that women had a finite amount of energy mm. and motherhood was going to sap that energy so they mustn't do arduous tasks. They mustn't do anything physical. I they think just there's need a lot of women there. that would agree with that. Now, <laughs> finite amount of energy. Motherhood's going to sap it. I need to sit here. Um, but but yeah. there's something in the zeitgeist clearly. Where's this coming from, this need? I don't know. I mean, possibly it's a metaphor, the kind of physical manifestation of channeling yourself into action. So it's not sort of talking about it, channeling all of that sort of... Deeds, it's not, it's words, it's deeds, it's not, deeds words. not words. <gasps> That's what it is. That? Look at you, look at you, queen I'm of the soundbite. such a suffragette. Blimey. Um... Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Deborah briefly interrupting your podcast listening to say that I will be at the Liverpool Film Festival on the evening of the 14th, showing my film Say My Name. So book tickets for the 14th of October if you are in Liverpool. And I believe there's a Q&A afterwards. Please come up and say hi. Also on the 14th, there's the Cheltenham Literature Festival where I'm doing a podcast there as well, A Guilty Feminist. Please come along to that. I think there might be still some tickets left. If you are in Cardiff, it will be there the weekend of the 20th of October and get tickets now if you would like to. 
I have also got a book out at the moment called The Guilty Feminist. It's about my views on feminism. And we are touring The Guilty Feminist show a lot more. We're trying to tour and we've heard your requests for that. We're trying to make the show bigger. We're doing a lot more with Help Refugees and Amnesty International. But our team is the same size. It's still just me and Tom. We don't sell advertising in case of anything clashing with feminism. We don't ask for Patreon. We're trying to keep the podcast as a weekly thing and make sure we put out a brand new episode every week, including Christmas. If you could buy the book, that would really, really help with that, with keeping the podcast going. It's available at Waterstones, other good bookshops, Amazon.co.uk if you must. And if you can get it in hardback, that would really help keep the podcast going. But it's also available in audiobook. Please get that if you'd like to hear me read it to you. And it's available in ebook too. But also, if you have bought it and read it, could you please go to Amazon and leave a review? Because that will really, really help it sell. So if you could go to Amazon.co.uk and leave a review and make it five stars. Thank you for the old days. Hello. Um, So, as an actor at drama school, you train to do stage combat. You do find yourself wondering how useful knowing how to use a broadsword is. Uh, We do a thing called, I'm going to teach you something real quick. Does anybody know what a nap is? You know what a nap is? A nap is the sound a performer makes to make the sound effect of a punch so that it's a non-contact punch or hit. So if something was coming from me, I would try and do this. And that sounds like something, not necessarily a punch, but hopefully people would follow the fist moving away and look at the action and buy that scenario. The problem with stage combat is that you are taught to never make contact. Now, there are contact punches and there are actually a lot of contact punches in our play, but when I had graduated from drama school, I had learned to always not hurt someone, not put them in danger, to always pull the punch at the last minute. So when I was set upon by two men in Brixton in 2008, come with me on this, don't worry, it's going to be all right. When I was set upon by two men in Brixton coming home from a party one night, it was actually the sun had come up at this point. Not that I'm rock and roll, I had had a kip on the couch waiting for the sun to come out, let's be clear. I was a few doors away from my house and anything that's dodgy happened to me in London. It's often happened close to my front door, FYI, just saying. Anyway, I heard a voice saying, have you got a cigarette? And I said, no. And then he went, come on, give me a cigarette. And I said, no. And I was feeling kind of, I don't know, I think I was so close to my door, I was feeling quite confident, you know, I was like, what is this guy going to do? And he sort of went to pushed me into a hedge somewhat. The twist was that a white van pulled up and a door opened. And I knew in that moment, I was going to die. (laughs) And I also knew in that moment, I knew how to pull punches, not to throw them. (laughs) So a sound came out of me that I can only describe as a sexual encounter between a whale and several bears. (laughs) Would you like to hear this sound? Okay. the sound that came out of me but imagine I'm trying not to break the BFI sound system imagine that sort of megawatt Uh, I made this sound and the man jumped back absolutely terrified and shocked and confused the van did a handbrake turn and drove off without his mate who was running down the street while I went run bitch run You could tell I was a film, an adrenalised film fan, paraphrasing Forrest Gump. Um, I was shaking so much with adrenaline, and at that point I saw a couple of lights go on, a few people like in houses, and in that moment, exactly as I knew I was going to die, I knew I was going to live. 
shaking. I entered my house and I thought, oh God, I, I should have a drink. I should, you know, you're in shock. The only thing available was archers. So I sat with a peach schnapps. Um, but what I realised in that very strange moment uh, a Brixton dawn in 2008 was that while drama school and stage combat had not prepared me to throw punches, it had given me projection like a motherfucker. Thank you very much. These are necklaces from our new Guilty Feminist collection made by Steve Alley, who's a Syrian refugee. And the proceeds go to half to Steve Alley's continuing education and half to his mother's project, which helps. She is also a refugee. And uh, her project helps female refugees get a trade because often they've been a radiographer or something like that. And then they go to Turkey and they can't speak the language and they don't have the paperwork. So these are beautiful silver necklaces from our collection. Um, Can I just already grabbing it? Yeah, yeah, you, you absolutely can. Oh my God. Uh, one Isn't says it? guilty feminist and the other one says woman in Arabic. I don't know which you want. I think the guests should always choose. Yeah, okay. So we'll, I'm just yeah. ripping mine over. Okay, so you're the guest, so you can choose which one. This is absolutely beautiful. Who made this? Oh, that is the one I was going to give you. If you would like to buy one, you go to road-from-damascus.co.uk. So putting it on, I love it uh, so dot co. UK. Wow. I'm a um, feminist, but I am fully going to cry right now. Yeah. Um, that's so beautiful. And uh, Steve is such an yeah. amazing person, and that's so lovely to have it something. Is, Thank you so much. They're proper silver, and he's a silversmith. He was an architecture student, but he learned to be a silversmith in the Calais jungle, and he started using wow. nails and electrical wiring and things like that, because wow. that's all he had. I feel bad now I haven't brought one for everyone. I'm mm. embarrassed. <laughs> but you can buy them. They're very reasonably priced, and they make great Christmas presents. Um, See, I should have kept that and re-gifted it. That's so selfish. And literally, I've no. ripped it open and put it on, like, straight away. Like, mine! No. Definitely don't re-gift it. Uh, so, there is a zeitgeist piece around turning our feelings into actions and not pulling our punches anymore. And I've really, really noticed Having this. a strong body... Mm. building your muscles, literally your physical muscles. You start doing boxing, you start doing anything like that. It translates into the way you stand, into the way you mm. act, into the way you, you know, interact with the world. And you know? I think, it, and as a sort of, you know, umbrella that covers everybody, no matter their ability or disability, it doesn't matter where you start or what you strengthen. It could be even working on your breathing to make yourself stronger. Whatever it is that you can move, move it and make it stronger. It's absolutely 100% true. Physical strength translates into emotional strength. And mental absolutely. strength. Absolutely. Mental strength. Sure. Um, so, Jess, could yes. you please tell us about your play? Where can we come and see it? Because I really do want to see you box in a corset. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when and where? Our wonderful play is called The Sweet Science of Bruising, and it's on at Southwark Playhouse. The first preview is on the 3rd of October. It closes on the 26th of October, so you've got three weeks in October, a little over three weeks. Do please come down and feel empowered and moved the way we're all feeling in the rehearsal room. It is just, it's written by joy, and it is a joy, and it's very, very special. And yeah, I'd love you all to see it. We will be there. Yay! Um, Jessica Hines, where can we see your film? It's premiering at the London Film Festival on the 17th of October at Picture House Central in Piccadilly. Wonderful. And then there's two other showings within the festival. And then I think it's going to be distributed and hopefully out in the cinemas next year. But if you like the sound of it, the trailer's going to be out in the next couple of weeks. And just, you know, I feel like I can't even say hashtag about it because I sound... No, no, no. I will say it for you. My mouth. I will say it. If you'd like to see it at a cinema near you, hashtag the fight movie. Tell us where you are so that distributors can find you and know where there is an audience for it. If you'd like to see it streaming, hashtag the fight movie and say, when's it going to be streaming? And that will create a demand for it because we do want this movie to be seen. There's so few movies written, directed and starring women and those that are have to be shot in 12 days. So we need to support them. So wrote a movie and have a cameo in it and it's called Say My Name and my friends who are in movies in Hollywood tell me that it's absolutely exceptional for a woman to write a script that actually gets turned into a movie that isn't about one woman slowly coming into her own in India or one woman slowly dying of a rare disease. Those are the things we're allowed to do on screen or maybe fall in love with a man but then it's half his story sort of thing. Um, and this movie has jokes, it has guns, 
from me. I don't know how I managed to write guns, but I don't like violence. If you'd like to see it uh, wherever you are, hashtag Say My Name Movie, and we'll try and bring it to somewhere near you. It's actually going to be on at the Liverpool Film Festival. You can buy tickets for that now, and the Cardiff International Film Festival, and you can buy tickets for that soon. And hopefully at the BFI. Can we show it at the BFI? Yep, done. Yeah. Yeah. As, as it's the BFI Guilty Feminist Film Club, I'd very quickly like to plug Best Pick, which is the podcast I do with Tom Selinsky and John Dorney. Tom Selinsky is the man behind the montage. We watch every single film that's ever won Best Picture at the Oscars, and we discuss it at length. And uh, yeah, it's really fun. So if you enjoyed these dulcet tones, please tune in. And if you'd like to see the montage that we showed at the beginning of the BFI Guilty Feminist Film Club, go to the show notes and you'll be able to click on the link. And can we book now already to see the fight at the, the uh, London Independent Film Festival? Absolutely, there's three dates. I think it's the 17th, 19th and 21st. You can absolutely book. Um, so uh, you sure should get in now because yeah. this is going to go out live and then everyone's going to buy the tickets. So if you've come live, buy tickets tonight for the fight, part of the London Film Festival. And while you're there, check out what else women are doing and go and buy things, uh, buy t- and buy tickets for what they're doing. Yeah. It's really, it's really, I've been so cogent for the whole podcast and we've, we've hit 10 o'clock and my brain's gone, you said we'd be done. Um, oh, also buy my book. Right. <laughs> so that. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Jessica Regan and our very special guest, Jessica Hines. The recording engineer was Grundy Lizimbra. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Selinski for The Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Chris and Amy at Phil McIntyre and everyone at the BFI as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. I mean, I'm a feminist, but I incorporated a slut drop into the (laughs) applause wrangling. That was beautiful work. Is that what it's called? Yes, ma'am. I've never heard that before. It's called a slut drop. I've never heard that before. I I thought it looked like a sort of inept twerk. I did not know. You are coming for me tonight, and I don't know why. No. I'm not going to stop word <laughs> inept twerking. No, 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 I just didn't know it was called a slut drop. I didn't know it was a different yeah, thing. Yeah, if it's like a bam straight back up, it's a, it's a slut drop. Mm. And if it's like kind of a continuous motion, that's more I've learned so much from you already. You're so welcome. Never say you don't learn about feminism at the Guilty Feminist. Yeah.